about uh, about biological farming. I uh, I live in Virginia, so we have different conditions than you all have out here in the West. Um, but I think some of the ideas are applicable. The uh, the description in the program I wrote a long time ago, so the talk will be a little bit different today. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, than I had intended about. Uh, and we'll talk about what is biological farming. We'll talk about the social aspects and the social ecology of small farming because I think it's really important if you're thinking about getting in and growing food for the living. And then we'll talk about using fungi and a little bit about cultivation. Um, so I, I believe everybody brings something to the table and to the class. And, and so if you have uh, something you'd like to contribute or a question, please don't hesitate to interrupt. All right. So. Uh, what is biological farming? Biological farming is uh, farming within the ecology, being part of the ecology and realizing that uh, natural processes occur and that we, we can farm along with those natural processes. We can create nutrient-dense and, and uh, toxin-free foods, which is what we're all looking for. Uh, if everybody has a chance to read these slides, I'm not going to read them to you. I'm just going to talk and you uh, can read them if you like. So uh, <coughs> this, is, uh, this is most of the uh, definition that's on the Virginia Association for Biological Farming website. That's a good source uh, for starting out looking for a few things on the East Coast. If you go to the actual website and there are a couple of others where you can get uh, good links to uh, excellent research on starting farming. But I've noticed that uh, the USDA and Risk Management Agency and a few others have uh, farm planning programs, but they are fairly narrow in their So, you know, resili building resilience in the farm and, and on the farm is an emergent property of, of balancing economic and ecological and social patterns. Uh, this is kind of a this is kind of a, a this is a Venn diagram, and the food production is in the middle. We have uh, we have all sorts of social uh, uh, phenomena that happen around food, and if we are tuned into the ecology, we are maintaining. Uh, the natural resources. And in order for this all to work, there has to be an economy to it. You have to make a living uh, and have some money to, to act in our economy. So, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, you know, we are, we are farming to, uh, to create healthy ecosystems, to, to create justice. Uh, in food and to alleviate hunger if we're really are working in that direction. So they talk about food justice and so forth, but I prefer to call it hunger. Really, that is prevalent in many parts of the U.S. and across the world, as you know. <coughs> so permaculture is one approach that we can take, and that is, uh, that is designing based on observations of natural systems. So we design our farm around natural systems. And and, uh, and flows and the energies that you find on the land. Uh, this is one of my favorite writers and speakers right now. Vandana Shiva is uh, an amazing person. If you've ever had a chance to see her speak or you can go on YouTube and hear her speak. She's, uh, she's beautiful. So I want to talk a little bit about the economy of small farming. <coughs> and this was kind of shocking when I first saw it. This is a graph from the USDA Economic Research Service. And uh, you can see here that in 2012, the average net income for a farm was minus $1,400. Now, this is all farms. 80% of all farms gross less than $5,000. That's little mom and pop farms that show up at the farmer's market and so forth. Uh, <coughs> the USDA's projected income for all farms across the U.S. this year, minus $2,500. Bucks. So, these are good numbers to know if you're thinking about going into farming. Uh, so, and you can see here, if the median total household income is this high, then you know most of the income is coming from off the farm. Somebody's got a job uh, working somewhere else, some for for <coughs> a salary or a wage. <coughs> so, this is just another graph of this. You can see residential, which are basically hobby farms and intermediate-sized farms. Uh, as, a, as compared in net income to uh, or, or median income to commercial farms, and commercial farms 
can make money because they have the policy infrastructure to be able to <coughs> sustain their prices. They have subsidies. They have uh, they take advantage of labor, and uh, <coughs> for many different reasons, they uh, they are able to uh, to outcompete and and capture a large portion of foreign income in the U.S. So again, you see off-farm income and median income. Um, you see, the, the off-farm income is actually more than the, the total farm income, which means that these farms are indeed losing money on that end of the pile. This is just an, uh, another way to look at it. Here's where we would be, probably. High-value crops. Uh, Includes fruits, nuts, vegetables, greenhouse, and nursery. Nothing about mushrooms. Uh, they have started. The USDA has started collecting uh, mushroom data from mushroom farmers every year now. And if you grow mushrooms, you you'll probably get that in the mail once a year. They just want to know what's happening and how quickly the industry is growing. They have no clue really, and they have no clue about uh, how much wild stuff is coming out of the woods, especially uh, some of the larger national forests on the east coast. I call them up. How many, how many mushrooms are coming out of non tip of forest products? Nobody knows. So it's not a regulated thing. Okay, so uh, as you see, the median total income is up here, but the farming income is in the negative area. Again, pretty interesting. So uh, this is a map of, uh, of the density of farmland across the U.S. The dark green is denser in terms of farm acreage. Land is one of those things that uh, land access is problematic for young farmers, and as we train young farmers, we're going to need more land. So there are some programs, land link type programs, that are, are teaming uh, people with land, uh, making it accessible to, uh, to young farmers, and long-term leases are, are starting to, uh, to work. Uh, a young couple in Virginia, Waterfenny Farm, figured out they took a 99-year lease on a piece of land from somebody that had arable acreage and wanted them to farm it. And uh, so I think they have a pretty good deal there. They're up here in D.C. They have a great market and are doing pretty well. Uh, other things that make uh, that would make farming more accessible to young people is to forgive their college loans. You want to go in and grow food, then then we're going to pay for your college. And uh, also. Um, <coughs> Also, a, a guaranteed affordable health care program for young farmers, for all farmers, for everybody, actually. So, uh, so I won't go off on that tangent, but those are some important things to think about getting into farming and, and how do you access land. It's getting very expensive. Um, uh, Mark, I'd like to touch on that a little bit, that and the, and the income that you were talking about before. <coughs> yeah. um, there is a, a, a type of urban farming called spin farming. Have you, uh, have you looked into it at all? I don't know much about that. Spin farming is, is small plot intensive farming. And pretty much the principle of it is, is you go around town and you talk to people and you ask them if you can use their yard to farm. And for, for the use of the yard, you maintain their grass that, that you're not you know growing on. Mm -hmm. Plus you give them a portion, almost like a C CSA, uh, for, for using their land and their water if they'll let you. Uh, and then um, you have several of those plots around town, and you can you, you uh, farm specific high yield, uh, fast growing crops that you can get high dollar for, like your salad, lettuce, like your lettuces, and different salad mix and stuff that restaurants can get. Uh, and uh, by doing that, all you, the only equipment you need is a rototiller and a trailer to pull it with yeah. a vehicle. Uh, and you don't have any land cost, so uh, you're you end up getting a lot more uh, income in the first year. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but if y'all look up spin farming on YouTube, there's a guy there that, that breaks it all down and explains that in his first year he he netted sixty thousand dollars by doing it because you don't have the equipment or land to use it. Yeah, there, I know a couple of projects where they're a backyard farmer and it's shells for foodscapes things like that, and they tried to do it all on bicycles at one time, but, uh, Well, you can, you know, you can get a little Toyota truck. And yeah, well, they, they, they do, they have a truck it. share, so there was like five or six people share a truck, and that's another way to get uh, equipment, equipment. I'll talk about cooperation in a little while. Yes. I was just going to say, I know a lot of farmers back home who make 
probably most, if not all, of their living off of connections with local restaurants and food trucks and just places that want to buy their food from them. They some of them don't even do the farmers market anymore. Yeah. They make so much money just. That's, that's what I do. I, I sell at restaurants. Yeah, I don't uh, sell at farmers markets anymore. We do we do food festivals and things like that. Uh, but uh, the farmers market was taken all Friday afternoon and get home Saturday at three o'clock. And all the farm tours still exist and wiped out on Sunday and going back at it on Monday it didn't appeal to me. And there are just uh, you know there are too many people that come up and say, are those real or uh, can I buy three mushrooms? You know, and I just don't, I just need to step away from that. You know, when I can go to a chef and sell as many mushrooms as I'm going to sell at the farmer's market in 10 minutes. Uh -huh. So, all right, so uh, so where does this resilience begin? Certainly with the soils, and you all know something about soils probably. Uh, so the healthier the soil, the healthier the plants, and uh, a reflection of soil health is, uh, is fungal life and, and diversity of, uh, of insects and, uh, and vertebrates. Uh, I, won't, uh, I won't go into that very much unless somebody has a specific question about soils. That's a whole different class. So how do you, what if your soil is just like really dry and really cold, how do you want to make it even more life? Would you just plant a covered crop of alfalfa everywhere? Or what I would mulch it as heavily as I could with uh, biomass. I'd be rolling out hay over top of it and planting a cover crop into it and, uh, and just mulch, mulch, mulch is the key to, uh, to dry soil and building soil because once you start getting that breakdown of material biomass on the top and you get earthworms and other animals that come up into it and, and start churning the soil for you. So, you know, it uh, depends on what size you are. Tilling, tilling initially can help, but after a while, tilling is unnecessary. I'm mean, was curious about uh, when you are encouraging more fungal growth in your soil, I'm um, curious about the effects on your pH of your soil. I mean, out here, I know we're, in general, fairly outlined. Uh -huh. But uh, you being on the East Coast, I like believe you're a little more uh, acidic. Uh, yeah, our soil is, uh, is a little more acidic. We have a lot of red clay. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if you look at Elaine Ingram's work, uh, she talks a lot about uh, inoculating the soil with compost teas by uh, fermenting uh, native microbes. She for did a lot of with microbes, right? She no, that. that's, that's another couple of fellows. They're journalists, oh, they're okay, not okay. scientists. Elaine Ingram, Soil mm -hmm. Food Web Inc. Soil Food Web. Yep. Okay. Uh, she's got some terrific information out there and just uh, results that are amazing from compost tea applications on uh, plantings for soil stabilization, soil uh, remediation, and also just farming in general. Yeah. Yeah, but do you worry about uh, perhaps dropping your pH too low, being already in a somewhat acidic environment? You know, I, uh, I'm not a I'm not a, a row farmer. I have a, a food forest of perennials, and I have a friend who is an herbalist, and she kind of tenant farms uh, herbs and other annuals. I don't grow any annuals. I trade for all of my vegetables and meat, uh, and that's easy for me. And so, as as part of your economy, that's also something that the USDA doesn't record. Uh -huh. you know, that's a that's that's been a two pe um, two people for almost a full year bartering. And not spending money on food except maybe yogurt and uh, organic. So cream. in doing a food forest, you want a little more acidic of a pH. Uh, you know, I didn't even test the soil. Uh -huh. It's like my my mantra and what I say to every plant I put in the hole is like, here's your opportunity to shine, grow here, or we'll plant something else. I love it. So uh, awesome. you know, yeah. and uh, so in that sense, we muddle through a little bit with different varieties, and they may die off. But uh, but uh, I also buy lots of. Lots of germplasm, different things in, like I uh, have about 15 types of currants and gooseberries, and I'll layer those out, and the ones that are successful will propagate into the garden and will sell out of the nursery. Mm -hmm. uh, the other ones, I just, just let them go. We'll yeah. do something else there. If, do you know of any farm and table restaurants, right, that are like, you know, they're not doing like social good to say people are hungry still, they're trying to mob on you then. So, like, they're partnered with like a school or anything like that that have like property that's somehow coordinated with like. Uh, well, now uh, there are farmers selling for for schools and institutional uh, relationships, and let me let me address that in just a minute. Sure. I'm going to get to that. Um, so, 
Y'all heard about this, right? Toledo was out of water because uh, their agricultural and wastewater runoff and manure runoff in their river uh, put so much phosphorus and nitrate in the water that they had a cyanobacteria outbreak and it overwhelmed their water system. So this is Toledo, Ohio over here. This is Cleveland over here. And right up this little bay, here's Detroit right here. So you got, uh, basically they polluted themselves out of water. It's totally insane. And this is from large monocultural operations that are over fertilizing and uh, also large animal operations that are not controlling their waste stream. Um, you can see here, it's pretty interesting. It, uh, it doesn't have the resolution I like, but you can see uh, in capitalist, this is about uh, uh, <clears throat> dead zones in the ocean, right around uh, where capitalist economies are flowing their waste into the and now we have uh, this year the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is about the size of Connecticut. Sometimes they call it the size of New Jersey or whatever. And this is where basically no other life can live but these uh, these algae and cyanobacteria that, that absorb all the oxygen in the water. So it's anaerobic conditions. And uh, this is all from fertilizer runoff, atrazine that flows off the land into the river. Just uh, so and you know we're at the, we're at a, we're at, a, at or beyond peak phosphorus right now. We've basically mined most of the phosphorus off the planet. <coughs> the biggest producers are China, and they don't sell it on the world market. They want to hang on to that. They need it for their agriculture. Uh, the U.S. produces some in Morocco, and uh, so and and uh, this is all phosphate rock. And phosphate rock is associated with uranium. So what they're doing is they're digging this up with radioisotopes in it, and they're processing it, and they're putting it out on the fields all over the world. Doesn't, doesn't compute really. So there's some good, there's some things happening to uh, recycle human phosphorus waste uh, through wastewater treatment systems and uh, crystallizing that, and then using that back on the field. So we need to, we need to be very uh, concerned about how we uh, conserve our phosphorus in farming. And fungi can help us with that, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So uh, our agriculture and forest byproduct waste comes to 1.3 billion tons. This coincidentally is the same number of food waste both across the world every year. 1.3 billion tons of waste. So look at the potential for growing mushrooms. There are all kinds of opportunities. You just have to identify what it is in your place, the agricultural and forest byproducts that are available and inexpensive that you can bring to your farm. You know, there are lots of concerns. Do a lot of research. You don't want to bring hay that's been sprayed with certain pesticides that are uh, long-term persistent because you can grow mushrooms on it and then you can mulch your garden, but your vegetables will die still. So there is a good chance that fungi will break those molecules down but even, uh, even it's good to be careful about that. So ask about uh, 